To be offended means that you take a hurt and you don't forgive. Sinful reactions must be processed properly so that they do not control the present. Only the blood of Christ and the power of the cross free people from the past. Welcome to the Transformation Seminar. This is the session on reconciling the past. It's one of the most important ones. Of course, we could say that that's for any one of them. But it's a very practical one. Let's put it that way. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I ask you to transform us. Change us from the inside out. Lord, I pray that you would give us courage to remove the mask of our own performance, of our own self-righteousness, of our own um, pride of not uh, humbly coming to you. Father, you're the one who changes us. Bless us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love and your grace. I pray this in Jesus' incredibly wonderful name. Amen. In order to live in the present, and I work with a lot of people who can't live in the present very well. And there are areas of my own life where I don't live in the present very well. When someone corrects me, I still flip back to how I was corrected as a kid. And my reactions still are often immature. I have to intentionally change my behavior, catch myself. But in order not, not to live in the past and to live in the present with a healthy view of the future, many of us need to reconcile the past. Here's what Jesus said. It's impossible that no offenses should come. Now, but woe to him through whom they come. In other words, there's people who, who bring offense, uh, cause offense, they're going to be held responsible. Now, an offense is a sinful reaction to a violation of a relational law. This reaction is called sin. When you sinfully react to an offense, or when you uh, uh, react in an ungodly way, it's sin. And then you've got, when, the moment you sin, you've got an issue with God. Now, when this becomes lodged in the heart, that means when it becomes a part of you, it becomes an avenue for demonic influence. That's what the devil needs to run you around. Sin causes also separation from God, and when you uh, sin against others, there's separation. Now, let's talk about the progression of an offense. Uh, Jesus was talking about the end time when there would be a lot of offense happening. And uh, he says, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. To be offended means that you take a hurt and you don't forgive. Now this offense becomes the bait for the trap. Let's use a, a simple common mouse trap. Okay? The mouse trap has a spring, and when we load it, uh, you notice that the bait for the trap is this little yellow. Uh, little yellow uh, shelf, and let me see if I can get this done correctly. Put enough pressure on it. Now, this, this little yellow thing here represents the cheese, the thing that the mouse wants, the bait. And when you take an offense, means that the bait, that you know, a hurt. Uh, that becomes something that will put you in a trap. So it's like this. Oh, you just really offended me. I remember our last session with, with a couple that's been seeing us. This fellow came in and he was, he had at least five or six offenses. And as he was, it, as he was uh, communicating his offenses, his anger just escalated and escalated. And pretty soon there was hatred in his eye. And pretty soon he just yelled. And soon his wife was crying. Now there's a, there's a, a natural progression of an offense. And the moment you take an offense, you do not forgive. And you gather it up. And you... Um, you know, think about it. Wham! Look what happens. The devil's got you. That's what he needs to hook you. 
So a lot of us, you know, we go around and it's like, you know, it's like having a, a, all these, uh, these traps on our hands and fingers and toes and so forth. We've got multitude of offenses. So you're offended, means you're hurt. You take an offense and uh, you're caught. The next step is you begin to betray. You only tell your side of the story at the expense of the other. This fellow was only telling his, sides of, the, his side of the story. And he, was, he, and, and he was so convinced it was his side that uh, he wasn't giving, getting a, giving us a balanced account. He began to betray his wife. Hatred started showing through his eyes. You hate means that the Bible way of hating is you withhold love. He, he was cold. He had shut down. Hadn't talked to her for a week. Then it says false prophets will appear. When you uh, take an offense, when you only tell your side of the story, when you withhold God's love, you begin to speak your story to others as if it's the truth. And you're, you could become totally convinced that it's the truth. Uh, it's another way would, we, we would say this person goes into denial. You can't see the truth anymore. You only tell your side of the story. And then it says, because lawlessness will abound, what happens once you go through these, these four steps, the fifth step is you break God's laws. You don't forgive, that's a breaking of the law. Once you believe a lie in your heart, you'll break God's laws. You'll justify yourself. He just, he just, I said, you know, you shouldn't be yelling at your wife like this. You don't understand. This woman has been doing this, and he just kept on escalating. And breaking the laws of a relationship. And what happened then? His love grew cold. It says the love of many will grow cold. Now you've developed a heart that's no longer capable of receiving God's love. Now remember... Or note that whenever pain or abuse or dysfunction happen, especially when you're young, your sinful responses form who you become and they determine the way you do relationship, the way you process what you experience. Offenses become the cracked lens you see life through, blinding you to the truth. Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, one of my... Uh, just went to the uh, eye doctor and he gave me these glasses. No, it's not really true. But you see... Offenses will start to cloud your vision. See, these are tinted glasses. You'll see everything is pink. Then the cracks in the lenses. You'll see everything distorted. That's what happens when your heart is full of an offense. All right? So you've got mouse traps on your fingers and you've got a crazy set of glasses on your, you know, on your forehead. And you'll see life through uh, those lenses and it blinds you to the truth. Truth is the way that God sees a situation. Now, offenses hook people to the past in several ways. The first one we've mentioned, but it's probably the most common one. I call bitter roots the, more, the common cold of relational breakdown. Common cold because they're so prevalent and, and also they're catchy. Uh, bitter roots, when offenses are not forgiven and become lodged in the heart. What we mean by lodged in the heart, it's part of who you become. It's part of your belief system. They become the root or the reason for sinful reactions. Hebrews chapter 12, 15 through 16 says this, See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it means it's your responsibility. Missing the grace of God means not able to receive from God. There's something that blocks God's grace in your life. You can't be graceful anymore. A bitter root is an area of pain and unforgiveness. It's like a hot button that whenever somebody touches it, wham, you go off in very predictable ways. Causing trouble means these areas, they motivate the non-relational behavior in your life. And defile many means that bad attitudes are catchy. This, you can, your bitter roots can be transferred to your children. Your bitter roots can be transferred to the people you work with. And... Uh, resulting in a whole group of people having a bitter root. Number two, uh, they're passed on by your reactions to the sins of the fathers. Now, reactions become habitual ways of behaving. Exodus 20, verses 5 through 6 says this, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. 
and showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Notice God equates love and obedience as the same thing. Sins of the fathers is translated iniquity in the King James. Iniquities have to do with the practice of a habit or a habit of sin that's passed on to the children. Now you can pass this on to the children several ways. Number one, by example. Children copy their parents. They copy what their parents do. I mean, you, you've raised children if you, you've been a child. And you, you do what dad does. You do what mom does. Now, if it's been hurtful, then you uh, tell yourself you'll never do it that way. Then you fall into the, into the problem of judging. So when you judge uh, your parents, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 says, Do not judge or you yourself will be judged. For in the way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you used, it will be measured to you. Judgments mean uh, these are sinful reactions to perceived hurt by putting yourself in a morally superior position to the offender. See, what you do is you say, I'll never be that way. I can remember uh, when I judged my father. My father was a very angry man. At least I perceived him that way. And I was afraid of him. And I told myself many times, I'll never be that way. I didn't realize what I had done as I judged him. Now you understand what happens when I let go of this pen. We call it, you know, if I let go of this pen, gravity will pull it down to the, to the earth. The gra the, that's the force of attraction between the pencil and between the earth. Because both, both the items have mass. And the, the force of attraction we call gravity or, or the weight of the, of the object. Well, think about this. For every action, there's an equal and opposite what? Reaction. Now, that's a fundamental law. How about this? Forgive or you will not be forgiven. Could it possibly be true that the same fundamental laws are true in relationship as they are to the created world? Now, once you get that, then you can begin to repent of breaking God's laws. And here's this one. Do not judge, or you yourself will be judged. With the measure that you measure, it will be measured to you. When I judged my father, I said, I'll never be like him. And if someone ever said to you, you're just like Fred, I would be angry. See, there was the, the anger is an indication of the hurt that was in that relationship. And so now if you say, well, you're just like your dad, you know, I have a much better view of my father or my reaction to my father because I understand he was strong. I understand that he was dedicated to God. You know, the man had courage. He took nine children from, from uh, you know, from Holland to, uh, to Canada. He took his, uh, at the age of 45, he took a family of nine children, you know, to a foreign land. I mean, that took courage. There's so many things about my father that, that are admirable, but when you judge, that filters out all that stuff. So to judge means you pass a guilty sentence that requires a punishment. So every time you judge, you know, your, your reactions are to punish. To judge is to usurp God's right to judge. Here you are, you're, put, you're taking God's place. Judgments become mindsets that cloud the ability to see truth in ourselves and the ability to see the good in others. Judgments guarantee that the offended will become the offender. Almost whenever I work with abuse, people that have been abused in childhood will abuse when they become strong enough to have power over someone. When people are bullied, when kids are bullied, they become a bully. And, and so this is the laws of relationship that guarantee that this stuff will pa pass on. It hooks you to the past. It guarantees your behavior. Making a vow is another way of passing it on. Matthew 5, 37 says this, Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Inner vows are self-directed promises made in reaction to a perceived hurt or a danger. They go in the opposite direction of the hurtful behavior or the pain. Statements like, I will never be poor again. You know, as, as kids growing up, I mean, I never had a new set of clothes because there were, there were, there were uh, seven or six kids ahead of me. There were three boys ahead of me. And so I never saw new clothes because we didn't have the money to buy new clothes. And, uh, and you know, one, one, uh, one set would go just down the row. And so now I've got an interesting phenomenon going on. It's hard for me to throw away clothes. Even when they don't fit, even when they're out of style, I start packing them away. You think I might have made a vow. 
that I'll never be poor again. I won't make my kids work the way I had to. They lock in your behavior, they exclude God's input, and uh, therefore an opportunity for real change. An inner vow puts you in the position of God in that area of your life. You have decided how you're going to behave, and it programs you to do whatever it takes to do or get what you proposed in your heart. I'll never be poor again, so you work like a dog. Work, 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 so, you don't be, so you're not poor. So you, you exclude God, God in your life. You exclude time with people. When this happens, God has no influence, but Satan does. That's the track he wants you to run on. So all these forces chain us to the past and create sinful ways of doing relationship. Just like a young tree is bent in a prevailing wind and grows up crooked, the result is whole families doing relationship are bound to the past, and they just perpetuate this kind of behavior. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the wages of sin is death means the what results from this sinful behavior is that families are separated. They become dysfunctional. They don't feel. They don't trust. They don't talk. And if you do it God's way, it's eternal life. Eternal life means you connect with God. You learn to live relationship at His level. Jesus becomes the center of your life. Death here means separation from God or distorted ways of doing relationship. So how do we heal this? Healing judgments and vows. Sinful reactions must be processed properly so that they do not control the present. You know, many people will say, well, I'll just forget about it. You know, just don't do that. That will not get you free of the past. The past is not the past until it has been reconciled in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says this, All this is from God, who reconciles, reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, uh, reconciled means that God has removed the offense. Reconciled means removing the offense, restoring the conflicting parties, and this is done through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I often use an illustration to represent how this, you know, the business of, of uh, sin toward God uh, what that means, and you can't get rid of it yourself. Uh, I use a, a demonstration of three sins a day. If you sinned three times a day, how many times a year would that be? Well, it's three times 365. That's uh, about a thousand. And let's say, uh, you know, I'm 63 years old. That means 63,000 crimes against God. Well, if you appeared before a judge, that's 63,000 offenses. You understand? Now, God loves you, but he hates the sin that you do. Somebody has to pay. Scripture says that, you know, sins are, uh, all sins are required. Sin, uh, payment for sin is required. God will not just wipe the slate clean for nothing. It required the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says without the shed blood, there's no forgiveness. So when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, when you believe that He paid for your sin on the cross, then something wonderful happens. He takes the offense. You're free to reach God. Number one, when you're going to heal this, you have to recognize that there are sinful patterns. We've got a generational pattern questionnaire at the end of your worksheet or in your workbook that you can use to identify patterns of sinful behavior in your life. And you can use the uh, letters of self, and whether they're current or whether they're historical. So use the letter S if this is for yourself. You can use the letter F if it's in your family. And you can use the letter C if it's current. And you can use the letter H if it's historical. All right? So fill that out, and then you can use it to deal with some of your issues. Secondly, you should take an inventory of how your way of relating has hurt yourself and others. With both of my children, I spent some time with them and intentionally asked them the question, how have I hurt you? Now, when you do that, don't excuse yourself. Don't say but if they do come up with something that you've hurt them with. I remember that when um, Jim was six years old, he wanted a brother. 
And so uh, there was a lady in our town who was working with the family services and they had a young boy that they couldn't place. He'd burned the barn down at uh, his last foster home. And so she thought since we were new Christians, we would be good candidates to have uh, him uh, live at our house. So Jim had been praying for a brother and uh, Daryl came to live at our house and after six weeks, because Daryl was wrecking his toys, because Daryl had to share his bedroom, because Daryl had to, uh, you know, didn't have the same habits that he did. Dear little Jimmy came to me one day and said, Dad, Daryl has to go. And out of my own rejection of the past, I said, Jim, should we put an ad in the paper if someone would like a little blonde, blue-eyed little boy? And he looked at me with pain, and I didn't recognize what I had done. You know, I was trying to use some way of getting him to feel the pain of rejection. And I was really speaking out of my own stuff. And I passed it on to my son because all of a sudden he said, Me, Dad? When Jim was 21 years old, I read a paper that he had written uh, for his master's degree uh, in seminary. And he talked about this incident. I never realized that kind of the spark of life went out of my son after that. He had taken an offense. And it went deep into his heart. It formed him. It formed his reactions. He became quiet. He was bubbly and excited, an excited little boy. And he became quiet. And I was blinded by my own, my own offenses. Didn't even see what I had done. When I asked him, did I hurt you? He talked about that. I didn't say, but, you know, I didn't realize, or I didn't make any excuses. I just, I began to cry. I said, would you forgive me? No, he forgave me. But it's still a reaction in his life. He is still touchy in that area. Letter C says, ask others close to you who will be honest. You know, I'm thankful that Jim was finally honest at the age of, of 21. Do not turn on those who are honest. I mean, don't, don't all of a sudden, if you haven't processed the pain, it'll feel like an attack. So don't turn on them. Allow the Spirit to convict you. You know, I began to cry. This is what I had done to my son at the age of six. And he'd lived with it for 15 years. Number three, identify your basic beliefs in this particular pattern of behavior. No, nobody's there for me. Nobody will love me. Ask God to take you to the root. Now start with a presenting issue, or incident, or a memory of the sinful pattern. You know, I remember, uh, you know, this, this whole idea of rejection. When I interpret things that Deanna does as rejection, start with that incident. Identify the prominent feeling in this presenting issue. It's very important that you do that. Because you see, what generates the feeling is your basic belief. So you want to follow the feeling back, allow the feeling to drift back to its source. And I, it drifted back for me to, um, you know, back in my hometown in Canada where we were, um, oh, how would you say it? We were called displaced persons, DPs. You know, we wore wooden shoes. We dressed differently. I mean, the kids at school were merciless. So I drift, you let it drift back to the source. Then describe the memory picture at the source. You know, I felt rejected. I felt like I was defective. Identify the basic belief at that source. That nobody wants me around here. You know, there, was, there were kids that were beating us up. I remember when my sister pulled me out from underneath a pile of about uh, 10 or 15 kids. And there was blood all over the place. My older sister had to... Um, rescue me. That was even more shameful than, the, than getting piled on. Anyway, then listen to what Jesus says or see what he does in that particular situation. I saw Jesus search for me under that pile. I saw him pick me up. He says, I'm here for you. I'll take care of you. And whenever Jesus speaks, identify what he says or does as the truth. This is, how, this is seeing it from God's perspective. Then you have to renounce the lie that nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. So you have, to, you have to get rid of it. You have to intentionally get rid of it because you chose to believe it. Receive His forgiveness and give forgiveness to your offenders. You have to forgive these kids. 
because you're still holding a bitter root, a bitterness in your heart. Repent of any judgments. Judgments means, you know, I'll never be like those kids. I'll never be like my father. And you know, when my hand was coming down on my son's butt and I was angry, I saw the same fear in his eyes that I had when my dad would discipline me. All of a sudden I had to realize, hey, I've just become just like him. Repent of any vows. You know, I'll never be poor. I'll never trust men again. Break the judgments and vows in Jesus' name. The cross has the power to free you. When you say in Jesus' name, that means Jesus is speaking those things to you. The Father is. And when you speak in His name, you're speaking words for Him. Then break any demonic influence. Once you've got rid of the lies, once you've forgiven, the devil doesn't have anything to hang on to anymore. The deliverance becomes easy. Ask God to fill these areas of your life with, your, with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will minister truth to you. Repent of sinful patterns handed down to you from your ancestors. You know, the Leinstrids are kind of angry people. They're stubborn. Repent of those things. And break the curses that resulted from these sins. Be accountable and be willing to practice new ways of, of relating. This happens best in a support group. These groups need to meet on a regular basis and practice group covenant. Use the thought intervention and truth therapy method to develop godly habits. You know, identify the lies and then put that big word stop below those lies. Stop thinking that way. Flip the card over and write out the truth. And as many truths as you can possibly find in Scripture having to do with the lies that you believe. All right. Conclusion. God's relational laws are as profound as the laws of nature. When we violate law, our hearts are broken, relational deficits are created, and people are trapped in sinful patterns of behavior. Only the blood of Christ and the power of the cross free people from the past. God bless you. Make sure that you do your group work. If you just take this as information, you're not going to change. You need to be willing to come to group and repent, or go to your counselor and repent. Identify these sinful patterns. Identify the lies that are running your behavior. Get healing for the pain that's in your heart. Repent of the way that you've hurt others. And God will bless you and God will keep you till the very end of the age.